Hi. I know this isn't a geology or climatology or physical geography class, but it's important that we discuss the changing global climate and physical features to put them in co into context with the human environment. We've got volcanoes, we've got earthquakes, we've got other, other natural hazards, and the reason why they're called natural hazards is because they affect people. If we had a volcano in Alaska, it's not going to affect a lot of people, and it's typically not going to be newsworthy or even called a natural hazard. But the ones that go through downtown New Orleans, like we saw with Katrina, or maybe potential volcanoes uh, at Mount Rainier in Washington, those are going to be of more import. And we're going to talk about those in Chapter 2. So whether we like it or not, the physical environment is the primary determinant as to whether a particular area can be settled, whether it's you know temperature, climate, weather, you know um, mountains, or you know accessibility near rivers, flooding, or, or whatever. When we look at landscapes, uh, we've got physical fabric of mountains, hills, valleys, plains, and then human activities associated with those, which can be impeded by these. Uh, these physical factors. We've got plate tectonics, which basically the Earth is divided into a number of different plates, about 20 of these different plates, and the Earth, uh, these plates are moving in different directions relative to each other. So we have these different plate boundaries. We've got convergent, divergent, and transform plate boundaries. And you can see a, a cross section of what they look like. We've got these convection cells that go throughout the, the core, uh, all the way down to the core throughout the mantle and the asthenosphere. So when we look at the, uh, the crust is more of a, is, is more of a physical, uh, you know, chemical division while we have the asthenosphere, which is the other upper part of the mantle, which is uh, a little bit more fluid and plastic that moves in different directions relative to each other. So you can see a map of these active volcanoes and these plates right here. The biggest one that we talk about is the Pacific Ring of Fire here. So we've got the Pacific Plate right here, and then we've got some of these smaller plates right here. We even have a smaller plate called the Juan de Fuca Plate off the coast of Washington. But you can see where most of our volcanoes are located around this Pacific Ring of Fire. But we have some like Vesuvius uh, in mainland Italy, and then I was up in... I was up in Iceland. We have a number of volcanoes that run right through the middle of Iceland at this divergent plate boundary as opposed to a convergent plate boundary. So you can see where a lot of your volcanism and your tectonic activity occurs, basically due to these plate boundaries. We also have intraplate seismicity, especially in uh, Eastern Tennessee seismic zone, New Madrid fault zone, uh, Oklahoma City of late. And so we do have some and we had one in Virginia in 2011 where we do have seismicity, we ha do have uh, earthquakes that occur in the middle of the plates and basically uh, they're not quite as big or as powerful as the ones that we see at the edge. You can see the cartographic representation uh, representing these plates and these boundaries. And you can see where these are, and around these areas, we've got a number of different uh, volcanic tectonic hazards here. Uh, the earthquake in 2004 that created the tsunami that killed 250 some thousand people here occurred right here at the Indian and Australian plate off the coast of Sumatra. We've got geologic hazards. Uh, they both happen in more developed countries and less developed countries, but I thought this interesting question here is why would less developed countries be more susceptible, basically because they don't have laws in place um, to, to retrofit buildings or whatever. Um, so a lot of the housing isn't going to be as secure. And then also in the Pacific Ocean, we have a Pacific tsunami warning system where the countries that surround the Indian Ocean, what we talked about with that 2004 tsunami, they don't have a network in place. You know, they're surrounded by countries like Indonesia, Thailand, India, uh, Quite, quite not rich, so they probably don't have the infrastructure to put something like that into place. So even uh, as applied to geologic hazards and natural and, and these natural phenomena, less developed countries or your, your developing countries are going to be more susceptible to the damage and then you know the upkeep, the infrastructure in terms of getting things back together again. You can see some of these spreading centers. We have subduction zones, transform uh, plate boundaries, and you can see the Cascade Mountains that run pretty much from Northern California all the way up through Southern, uh, through Southern Canada there. 
Uh, there was one in 2000, I think this is the one in 2001, this is in the Squally earthquake um, down near Olympia, Washington right here. I was actually, at the time, I was living out here in Idaho. And then Mount St. Helens. Okay, I was old enough, I'm old enough to remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens. There just used to be a actual mountain right here and the upper 1500 feet of it was pretty much blown off. And this is what it looks like now. So 35 years later, we can actually look at it live via the internet. This is a global distribution of earthquakes, volcanoes, and our oceanic ridges that we were talking about before. You can see your Pacific Ring of Fire. So we have a lot up in Alaska, off the coast of California. We've got some of these volcanoes. A lot of these are not active. They're, they're either going to be dormant or extinct. But where they do affect areas, that's what we call a natural hazard. You can see a number off the coast of Alaska here. They don't affect a lot of people, that, but they do affect airplane airplane travel across the Pacific Ocean. We have climate. Climate is the study of weather over a period of time. Okay, so we have we've heard the term global climate change. The whole idea that average global temperatures are going up. Um, in Virginia, eastern uh, eastern seaboard for the most part, temperatures were relatively low this past year. I'm talking about 2017, 2018. But if we were looked at this average over 30 years or five year periods, we can see that it's going up. Okay, so I really want to portray those. And then these are just some of the components that affect climate. The amount of solar radiation, which we call insulation, latitude. As you go further and further north up to the North Pole, you it gets colder. Um, Specific heat capacities, so continental effect, land heats up and cools down faster than water, the maritime effect. So you get places like Seattle and even Alaska, they don't get a lot of snow because the water is always relatively warm. It takes a lot more effort and energy to warm up or cool down these large body of waters, and it gets into the whole idea of specific heat altitude, global wind patterns, and whatnot. So you can see some of the pressure zones here, these westerlies, um, these westerlies polar highs uh, that converge down at this ITCZ, intertropical convergence zone. And so you can see how these air masses interact. And then we have maritime air masses that you know come off the coast um, off of Gulf of Mexico, uh, which are going to be moist, warm. We've got cold polar, you know, these are called um, continental polar, cold, warm airs. And typically in the United States, we have these cool, warm, moist combination of these meeting in the middle of the countries. And that's where we get a lot of this instability, which we call tornadoes. About 95% of all tornadoes in the world actually occur in the United States. So that's a phenomenon that's typically unique to the United States as opposed to the rest of the countries here. We can divide these climate, um, these climate zones based on, on the Kepin climate zones here. So we can look at tropical zones. We've got a number of different deserts. Uh, we've actually got you know cold deserts, warm deserts, because deserts are basically areas that receive little precipitation. But when we combine altitude, these global temperature patterns here, you can see what these climate zones look like. And I thought this was kind of interesting. You can see all the things that can happen to heat in the sun's rays once it hits the Earth. It can be absorbed. It can be reflected. It can be scattered. Okay, And a lot of times, if we look at, you know, we have something called an a, um, urban heat island, which Typically, urban areas have higher temperatures because it's made out of materials that absorb the solar energy as opposed to reflect it out in rural areas like grass and trees or whatever. So you can see some of the things that go on with the sun's radiation. We have the effect of global warming, melting polar ice cap, and su subsequent sea level rise. If you were to look at my uh, Alaska travel video, I think I've got a picture of a uh, the Mendenhall Glacier, and it's actually been going. It's been receding uh, over a period of years. You know, about 100 years, it's moved back on the order of you know, I think about a mile or so. So we can see the cold water entering the the northern oceans that change the dynamics of it. Okay. So, like I talked about here, you can see, you know, your temperatures here. You know, I grew up in New Jersey, and out in, you know, New Jersey, our temperature was a lot lower, you know, four, five, six degrees lower than it was in downtown New York City. So, you know, the whole idea of urban heat islands. 
and then we can start to look at what's happening with the the ocean the land uh, back to the ocean again and, and what's happening with these and especially the temperatures have been going up and up and you know there's no denying that you know in some places actually places like Billings Montana temperatures are slightly going down you know, over the past 30 40 years but on the whole scale of things you know average temperatures going up and how do we address that how much of that is man-made we had something called the little ice age in the 1300s we had the ice age 15,000 years ago so we we know that those weren't caused by man you know anthropogenic or man-made activities so you know how much of this is contributed to does man contributed to this and how much is it just natural effects and, and those are interesting and those are difficult to parse out I thought this was interesting this would be the east coast of North America of the eastern Antarctic ice sheet had a 100 about 50 meter rise in sea level so you'd see Washington DC Baltimore where uh, Germanic Community College is located would be oceanfront property you can see what this looks like in Europe so I thought this is very interesting the other thing we have, um, we have different resources, natural resources, but one of these that is limited is water, yeah, especially fresh water. We just can't go and magically get water. So if we pollute it permanently, well, we're, we're not going to be able to replace it. Uh, so we have a very limited supply. So, you know, flooding. So you, you can see where some of these aquifers are how much is used, how much is used for domestic, industrial, and agricultural. A lot of it is used for agricultural. And then some of the issues with man's impact or human impacts on uh, the flora and fauna, okay? desertification, um, deforestation. When we cut down forests, we're actually increasing things like erosion that we don't think of. So I, I thought some of these were, were kind of interesting here. Um, industrial and traditional agriculture you know how do these affect it and um, this was the Palouse region out in Washington State I used to live out in this region here so this is called the Palouse which I thought was interesting we've got the Green Revolution um, so basically the, the use of non-renewable fossil fuels water pollution from agricultural runoff and then how do we how do we address those you know like I said before um, environmental degradation is going to be a you know trade-off to sustainability we can't just get rid of all of the people you know you know that would be efficient at all but how do we have these seven point something billion people coexist with the environment so we can keep this going further and that's about it for chapter two